a lot of people, they have built that first step of emotional awareness. I am aware of my feelings, but there's a next step that's incredibly important to your mental health, which is I validate this emotional experience. Hey, everybody. Today we have Hannah Bowers. Hannah, please tell us a little bit about yourself. Hello, everybody. Ari, thank you so much for having me. My name is Hannah Bowers. I am a singer, songwriter, musician, artist, producer, um, but I do a lot of other things uh, than that. I'm also a coach. I'm also a mentor, and I run my own company that brings together creative people to bring them community and support their growth. And mental health is an incredibly important uh, pillar in all those areas of my life. And I've been kind of just being a creator and, and growing um, since since a child. So that's that's my life in short. Amazing. Yeah. So we have a few questions today. Let's start with, what are some unique mental health struggles you face as a member of the LGBTQ plus community? Growing up as someone that identified as bisexual, which also took me a long time to realize, that in itself was a mental health challenge um, because there's kind of this need to like understand yourself and it's very complicated when you feel like you can't and when you feel like there is something about you that is different than everybody else around you, which in a lot of ways is not true. There's a lot of people that are in the LGBTQ community um, that maybe just aren't out or maybe haven't realized it yet. But it was a challenge for me that in puberty, um, starting to really like question all of these things about me that made me feel so different. Like I remember walking around school and just feeling like I am the only person here out of hundreds of people on this campus that has these feelings and that makes me weird. And it's so isolating to feel that way. And you can't, you feel like you can't talk to anybody about it because you think that that's going to make you weird or people are going to judge you. So you carry around all of this shame and guilt. And this is just, you know, my experience, all of these questions that we talk about today, that is my experience and everybody's experience with mental health and with their sexual orientation and their sexuality, like it's completely different for everybody. Um, But I would say with my experience and people that have talked to about it now, after, you know, going through all of these, um, you know, reckonings and, and healings is just really profound shame and guilt um, because we feel othered and we feel different. And we see that, um, perpetuated in headlines, you know, um, it feels like society doesn't want us to be ourselves and we're not allowed to be ourselves. And there's a copious amounts of shame that go into just being who you are. Thanks so much for sharing that. Yeah. Would you be willing to share anything about your coming out experience and how that affected your mental health? Yeah, sure thing. Um, I, I feel incredibly lucky, incredibly privileged about my coming out story. Um, I also think that that's important to share because I think it is good for people to hear the stories of, you know, I'm not alone and that this was, you know, a, a terrible part of incredibly hard, like resulted in all of, you know, these negative experiences. But it's also important to know that for some people, like it might not be as bad as you think. Um, and for me, I'm lucky enough that that was my case. Um, but I did hide this for a very long time. Ultimately I was hiding it from myself the most of all. And once I finally embraced that, okay, I think I'm bisexual and I got excited about it for like the first time. And I came out to my friends, just my closest friends. There was no big public outing of myself, no Facebook posts. This was when I was a a junior in high school. And 
I just came out to all my best friends and like just one by one kind of <laughs> took them aside. And it was a very exciting moment for me. And luckily they were all incredibly supportive and excited. And it was, it was just this liberating moment of so many more things are possible now that I have accepted this part of myself and I've shared it with somebody else. So for me, my coming out experience was very positive and I'm so lucky to be able to say that. I feel the same. Like, I feel like yeah. it's a privilege that like some people yeah. had such a horrendous time with their coming out. And I feel like I call my coming out actually a becoming out because I didn't even, I wasn't I like hiding anything. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know that I could be pansexual. So for me, it was like, hi, I'm now queer. <laughs> I remember coming to you being like, what is LGBTQ plus? Yeah. How do I identify? What does this mean? Yeah. And like coming to you specifically because I yeah. looked at you as somebody who felt so comfortable in your skin and like knew who you are. And I was figuring that out in this new yeah. identity. So thanks for being there for me while I was kind of feeling yeah. like a baby gay, as I was calling it. <laughs> oh, you're so welcome. And I, I have loved, like, I feel like I, you know, had that experience so young and because I was so lucky in it being healthy for me, that allows me to support other people who come to those realizations a little bit later in life, you know, like I was able to build this like strong foundation to then support other people as they were becoming out, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. Um, are there any specific tools for mental health that would help maybe just anybody and then any tools that you think would specifically support the LGBTQ plus community? Yes. A million and one. And <laughs> um, it's interesting. It depends on what phase in your mental health growth and your mental health journey that you're in. Different tools are going to help you. Um, for example, if it's very new to you to take care of yourself, I mean, that's the biggest part of mental health right there is just self-care. And for different people, that looks like different things. Some people that's like, okay, self-care means I got out of bed today. Self-care mm -hmm. means I took a shower. Self-care means that I went outside. Self-care means that I talked to someone today. Those are all tools that you could use for mental health. And they might seem really simple to somebody. And especially if you're in a state where you're dealing with, you know, incredible mental challenge um, those things, you might not see them as tools for your mental health, but through consistency, you realize like, oh, I'm actually making improvements. And if you're a little bit further along, you might step out into trying some new things that you are actually exploring those emotions that are really overwhelming to you. Um, something else that I practice is emotional intelligence, and I'm a certified emotional intelligence practitioner and assessor. And there is a practice of just becoming aware of your emotions and understanding that they are valuable, respecting them, validating them, and then choosing an action that is aligned with them and aligned with yourself. So a lot of people, they have built that first step of emotional awareness. I am aware of my feelings, but there's a next step that's incredibly important to your mental health, which is... I validate this emotional experience. These feelings that are coming up are here for a reason and I have to respect them. I can't resist them. So there's so much acceptance that acceptance itself is a tool for mental health. Accepting your feelings, accepting your thoughts, accepting who you are, what you want, who you want to be, what you want to do. And especially if you're a part of the LGBTQ community, like I said in the beginning, one of the biggest challenges that people who are in that community usually deal with is shame. So acceptance is the greatest tool that you can practice if you're experiencing shame. So those are some other ones. Other just very specific ones I like to incorporate in my day personally are just like almost every day I'm doing yoga or some sort of movement. I go outside, I meditate, I write my feelings down in some way. It could be creative, it could be a song, it could be a poem, it could be just venting. Um, and then community. So surrounding yourself with people and connecting to other people that 
you relate to and that make you feel good about yourself, being aware of who the people, who, the, who you surround yourself with, how they make you feel um, and making sure that you feel supported and that you're sharing yourself is also an act of acceptance of yourself. So those are just some, a, a wide array of tools that I would recommend. Yes. I love how you put that. And self-care is really so many things for so many different people. And what I learned recently, which I think is so powerful is that 80% of our wellness actually has to do with taking care of our basic needs. So that means drinking enough water, eating healthy, exercising enough and sleeping well. So like the basic things that are good for our overall physical health are actually the most integral for our mental health. And then anything additional like meditation, yoga, sound baths, creativity, nature, therapy, medication, if you need it, those things are like on top of those basic needs being met. So if basic needs aren't being tended to, that's the first place to start. Yeah. And I think will feel so much better if you're just like taking care of your sleep habits and your eating and your nutrition and your hydration. Totally. Um, So, so important. And I love what you said about emotional intelligence. Would you be willing to share why improving your emotional intelligence is valuable for your mental health? Oh, absolutely. So the key part of emotional intelligence that I was talking about is just this understanding that they are valuable. And that is just the first step to unlocking like, okay, well, what am I going to do with it next? Um, There is so much resistance to feelings that are uncomfortable. And when you practice emotional intelligence, you recognize that that discomfort doesn't mean that it's a bad thing. We often say like there are negative emotions and there are positive emotions. I'm sure they feel negative and they feel positive. But what they really are is just kind of neutral information. And when you practice emotional intelligence, you're kind of practicing this idea of like objectivity, like, okay, well, sadness points to me that, um, you know, there's not enough of something that I love. I'm not experiencing, you know, the opposite of sadness, which is joy. I'm disconnected from the things that bring me joy. So when we feel sadness, it's not just, oh, I feel sad. I hate that I feel sad. I wish that I didn't feel sad. It's like, oh, I feel sad. I should, what what can I do about that? You know, that is going to transform that sadness into something that aligns me with what feels authentic and what feels purposeful and what feels valuable. And on the kind of, if you were to look at emotional intelligence as like this process, one of like the last components is it, and in, in, that's a part of it, is um, value and purpose. So you're connecting your emotions to your value and your purpose. And it's truly amazing. And I could get into it. It's so layered. Um, but having a clear understanding of what your values are and what your purpose is, and maybe not even like, it's hard to come up with a purpose. Like my purpose in life is this. But I always tell people, like, you can come up with, like, a work in progress purpose, you know? Like, you can just be like, well, I really like helping people. It's like, great. Like, let that be your work in progress purpose. Like, I'm here to help people. Having a purpose and recognizing that can align with your daily actions. And you wake up and you're like, I have to live my purpose today. And my emotions are coming up because they're telling me this is what's important to me. And if I'm not acting in alignment with what's important to me, I'm probably going to keep feeling these same emotions because I'm not listening to the messages that they're bringing up for me. Yes. I've like, you're going in so deep and I'm layering so many things (laughs) that I want to like get deeper on these things. And I think something really powerful you said about emotional intelligence is just that mindfulness so that awareness of how we're feeling, how to process it and how to identify what is missing and where these emotions are coming from and then how to regulate our way through it, um, through the awareness and validation and practical action. And one thing that I think is so powerful is affirmations. And I did affirmations in the year for four years consistently, and it changed my life. And now I do them kind of, I get into bouts where I do it for a month and I'm off for a few days and I'm kind of a bit more lenient now, but it, it changed my life looking in the mirror, putting my hands on my heart and saying, I am statements attracting what I need in my life 
something as simple as I am supported by life. I now go beyond other people's fears and limitations. I create my life just as simple as that. And one thing that I noticed you said is like, okay, if I'm experiencing sadness, that means I'm missing the joy in my life. So it's interesting if we look at our negative emotions and then can see it as a pendulum kind of like, okay, on this side, yeah. I'm feeling um, sadness. And then what's on the other side of the pendulum? That is joy. How do I get back there and let it swing? Because the further we swing one way, the further we can swing the other, which is incredible when you think about how deep and dark emotions can get. That means we're craving, we're paving a way for even heightened, more bright light um, manifestations and ways of being. But I love this identifying what's missing because then we can use practical tools in addition to affirmations to kind of in in like it manifest those things into our life. So for example, if I'm someone who's experiencing sadness and they want more joy in their life, instead of an affirmation that is, I do not want to feel sad, that is not because yeah. you're putting out the word sad into the atmosphere rather than putting out the opposite. It was, it would be, I am now attracting joy in all aspects of my life. Yeah. And I think it's just so powerful to see, to see what is missing and to use that as our point of attraction. And so that kind of brought that up to me. And then it made me think of opposite action, which uh, is a DBT technique, which I love, which is doing the exact opposite of how you're feeling. Yeah. So for example, if I'm sitting on the couch feeling like a couch potato and I don't want to do anything else but binge Netflix and it's already been three hours of this, mm -hmm. I know that's only going to make me feel worse. So the yeah. opposite action would be to like get up and do a bunch of jumping jacks and burpees or put on a 20 minute yoga, yeah. YouTube yoga with Adrienne. She's amazing. <laughs> My hero. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so there's just so many things came up there. Sorry for getting off topic. It just I, I find it no, so fascinating. That's amazing. And I think I have so much to say about all those points, but kind of like a key one that I want to bring back to the subject of like LGBTQ experiences in mental health is the kind of correlation between like subscribing as a person in the LGBTQ community and the importance of affirmations because that root feeling of shame in who you are is coming from stories that other people are saying other voices outside you saying you are bad for feeling this way you are wrong for feeling this way you are you know you 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 people pointing the finger at you when you practice affirmations you're reclaiming who you are you're allowing yourself to say i am this I can be this. I can choose this. I don't have to subscribe to what you tell me I am. I have the power that I am reclaiming in this affirmation to write a completely different story about who I am. So I think that makes affirmations an incredibly powerful tool for people in the LGBTQ community. I agree. Affirmations, as I said already, changed my life. I used to not love myself and then saying, I, I love you to myself in the mirror every day for four years. I grew to love myself. And I've had some people say, well, what if I say an affirmation and I don't believe it? Well, mm -hmm. you will eventually believe it. Yeah. There is truth into, you know, fake it until you make it and smiling tricks your brain into believing you're happy. So if we say I am statements over and over and recite it to ourselves, we're repaving that neural pathway to make that choice. We're neuroplastic and we have the ability to change our belief system about who we are. And especially if we're queer, saying statements like, I radically accept who I am. I am worthy of self-love and greater love. I am here with a purpose. I am valuable. Um, I am beautiful as I am. Statements like that as simple as just one of them can be so powerful if we say them every day and repeat them and mm -hmm. look right into our own eyes in the mirror and like say it with conviction, even if it feels uncomfortable at first. At first, mm -hmm. I remember crying when I said I love you in the mirror and like then laughing and then being like, I am weird. I'm crying and laughing. <laughs> and then finally, I was like, I say it with all seriousness and I mean it. So it's yeah. just like patience and practice, right? Yeah. Well, and that as affirmations is the art of reprogramming. So if you don't, there's a reason that you don't believe it at first when you say it, because your beliefs have been programmed by the society that you live in and the stories that everybody else is telling and everybody else is believing. But you need to change that story. Maybe deep down, you do believe you love yourself, but it's covered up in all these stories and beliefs that we are conditioned to have um, from the people that we see in the media and the people that we surround ourselves with. And, um, 
it is incredibly powerful to reclaim that story through affirmation. Um, and so, yeah, I just think that that's a really key component that you hit on there. Thank you. Thanks yeah. for sharing that. Yeah. So I'm excited about this question. Okay. What is queer joy and why is it important? <laughs> for sure. Um, queer joy, uh, as kind of the it says in the name, is just the joyness of being queer and that radical self-love and self-acceptance of uh, experiencing joy and love and happiness and freedom as a queer person because so often in media the representation of people in lgbtq community is in the shame and in the trauma and there is so much focus on the struggle, which is important to tell. It is important to recognize that we deal with that, those things and that is real, but it's not the only story to tell. And as we're talking about like feelings being on a spectrum, like we need queer joy if we're being like thrown all this queer sadness and queer trauma. In all of that, queer joy exists. And we need to tell those stories and we need to see that. And we need to see that being a part of this community can be joyful. And there is so much beauty on the other side of it when we practice that acceptance and we embrace our community and we embrace ourselves. And we embrace this whole other world of emotions that are available to us. Um, so queer joy can be seen in movies it can be seen in music it can be seen in culture it art it can just be seen in like events and in public spaces and walking down the street holding your hands with like your partner and being happy it's just like there's queer joy there's queer joy there's queer joy so it is just the experience of being joyful in your queerness which is the kind of healing tool for feeling shameful of our queerness Beautiful. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. How does the representation of LGBTQ plus in media play a role in perpetuating mental health stigma? When members of the LGBTQ community see themselves in media portrayed as traumatized and depressed and anxious and, and um, just struggling so hard, we see ourselves and we see that part of ourselves. But we often don't see the queer joy and we don't see the other parts of what it means to be a queer person. We don't see just like being like, I don't know how to phrase this in the best way, but like when I see myself on TV or in a movie, I don't want it to be this like requirement of like, we need to put a queer person in there. And this person has a, you know, unique story because they're queer. It's like, yes, they do. And that's important, but it's also just like normal, <laughs> you know? So it's like normalizing the whole spectrum of the queer experience. It's like, yeah, I have unique trauma from being queer, but I also experience unique joy from being queer. And I experience unique everything else just because I am a person and it doesn't matter what my sexual orientation is. So unfortunately, I think there is a lot of representation in media of the queer community as just the traumatic and depressing and all the hard parts. And I think when we see that, we might be thinking that that's all that's possible for us. Like it's saying, yes, this is really hard. And that's all it's saying. It's not saying, yes, this is really hard. And there's so much more and there's so much healing available to you. And it's not the only thing. It's just saying, look at how hard this is. So I think there's a long way to go for queer representation in media to normalize it um, and to make it just feel positive and healthy. I agree. I think sometimes I, I do see a lot of stereotypical um queer characters where like a, for example a super flamboyant guy and like or you know a really butch kind of girl for example mm -hmm. just naming some of the stereotypes was that you know there's not really a look to being gay although like some right. people do have give off a look or a more stereotypical image of what has been portrayed in media that kind of gives those telltale signs 
but I think it's fascinating. I think that there is this common practice of like throwing in the token gay person or token yeah. BIPOC community member or, or just like to make sure that people feel represented. And it would be nice if it came off a bit more naturally. And I just think it's a great first step that like it's being included and that there's diversity and inclusion in the media more prominently now than ever. And I think that's like going in the right direction. Then eventually it will become a bit more smooth and like less deliberate and just more mm -hmm. natural. Yeah, exactly. Like I want to see myself in media and not have it be like this, you know, that, that their sexual orientation be completely vital to the storyline. Like I want to see yeah. a queer person in media and have it be like almost irrelevant, you know, mm -hmm. that it's just like, yeah, they're gay and we don't need to talk about it. You know, we don't, yeah. we don't need to acknowledge it in this really obvious way. And I think I think that can be done by just having more queer people behind the camera and on camera and just in the production of this media, uh, because then they know how to tell the stories in an authentic way that, you know, doesn't um, try to make it um, something really focused on this one part that is, you know, what we think of when we think of the queer experience. There's so much more things to think of than what we see for sure yeah I think what you're trying to say is like instead of having characters be one dimensional and be all about their sexual orientation or gender identity that we're multi-hyphenated people and it's not our day-to-day -day isn't just all driven by our queer identity that there's mm -hmm. so much more to each character yeah um, exactly uh, okay how does your relationship to sexual orientation affect your mental health yeah so in the in the beginning of my experience and understanding my sexual orientation, uh, it was very challenging for me. It, you know, like I said, it brought me a lot of shame. It made me feel really depressed. It made me really not like myself, like hate myself, honestly. And that has then transformed, you know, over the past 10 years, I believe I came out 10 years ago, um, to, love myself so much more than I ever could because my sexual orientation is part of what makes me like completely authentically me and what brings me the most joy in this world is the experience of being completely authentically me so I am so happy to say that I have now healed my relationship with my bisexuality and with my gender expression um, to say that this is something that I love about myself and I'm still working on it. You know, there's still little hiccups where I like catch a thought come in or I catch like it, an impulse or a reaction. And I'm like, oh, that's based in like trauma of, you know, not loving myself and being conditioned to feel shame. Let's heal that. There's just layers of, of wounds, you know, that I've collected over the years um, but now that I have embraced my sexual orientation, it is something that makes me love myself and love my life even more because it's just who I am and I am learning to love exactly who I am. And that's where I experience the most joy. Beautiful. I relate to shame so much and I'm grateful to say I have none of it right now mm -hmm. but the worst shame I ever went through was after being hospitalized in 2016 and being diagnosed with bipolar like I had more self-stigma than any outward stigma going on in my life no one was stigmatizing me but myself and it was really detrimental for my own mental health like it made me worse I couldn't get out of depression I cycled from depression into PTSD into mania into psychosis right back into depression when I realized that like and was back in reality and then realized that a hospital experience and diagnosis is now part of my life I couldn't like get over that and it wasn't until I turned pain into power which I'm hurt and you've probably heard me say so many times now Heck yeah. um, and and just like became very vocal and put it in my music and started seeing it as a gift rather than a weakness and something I can harness as a superpower which I can say now after four episodes of mania, I've been able to make them into like hyper productivity mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and creativity. But the shame I felt was so 
bad. Like I, and it took me like doing opposite action and becoming vocal mm-hmm. and courageous and brave enough to speak publicly to combat that shame. Mm-hmm. So have you ever felt shame when it comes around mental health and like if any diagnosis or a mental health challenge you've gone through, has that given you any shame you had to work through? Yeah. Uh, in a, in a lot of different ways too. Um, definitely when I was younger and I dealt with depression, I once again, I thought I was the only person that was depressed. So I thought I was the only person that was gay. And I thought I was the only person that was depressed. So there was like copious amounts of shame in my teen years around that. And I think I started to realize, you know, in my senior year of high school, um, people started talking a little bit about mental health more in these little tiny workshops like that were held at my school. And I was like, oh my God, like, other people feel these things. That's amazing. But I did feel so much shame around that and just isolating myself further and further and further. And the more isolation there is, the more shame there is, the more depression there is, the cycle, 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 cycle. Um, and I would say, you know, now I have healed so much of that. And I, I, I learned about this shame cycle from my therapist several years ago because even though I had been healing it for years, um, I didn't realize that this was a conscious, pa- an unconscious pattern that I had created. Um, and now I can kind of catch myself in the shame cycle, but it comes up all the time and I can kind of recognize, I know what my triggers are, as I'm sure that you do, and that can help you turn your pain into power because you can say, oh, this is something that I, this experience is coming up and I know that I'm likely and it's possible to go down this path and that's going to hurt me and it's just going to feed itself and become this just gnarly depression monster. Or I can recognize just at the very first trigger, like I have the option to choose something else and that something else is going to be the opposite of shame. It's going to be self-acceptance. It's going to be love. So what does the action, the opposite action of shame in that moment is looking like love? How can I act in love right now? So yeah, that I'm so familiar with that shame cycle and um, I kind of love that I'm familiar with it now because it's so helpful to be able to recognize it when it's coming um, and just constantly be unlearning it. Yeah, that's great. Thanks so much for sharing that. And it reminds me of this amazing, very simple thing to remember that like we always have the choice between love and fear and that yeah. every decision boils down to either of those very opposite choices. Mm-hmm. And I always remind myself to choose fear. I mean, not choose fear, to choose love. <laughs> I was just thinking of the word fear while I said fear. Yeah. But yeah, I always remind myself to choose love, not fear. Because fear is sometimes so tempting. And mm-hmm. um, it's like, sometimes yeah. there's this like safe place in fear. Of, like, that's what we know. So it's mm-hmm. easier to choose the fear. But choosing yeah. the more difficult route, or sometimes the really easy route to go to the root of love is always yeah. key. So well, yeah, pick it every day. Exactly. And in, in choosing love is choosing vulnerability. Yes. And vulnerability means that I am at risk of feeling more pain and more discomfort. And if I am incredibly depressed, I don't want to risk going any worse than that. But what we don't know is that when we are choosing fear and choosing to, you know, protect that pain rather than unleash it, it's ultimately doing us more harm than good. And there are certain instances where we do have to, you know, know when to protect ourselves and when to go to down the vulnerability path, because sometimes we can open up in a fragile state and that can spiral in a different way. But ultimately, yeah, I completely agree with what you're saying with there's always the path of fear and the path of love. And even the path of love knows when you need to take care of yourself and your vulnerability. And Mm -hmm. it's, it's so nuanced. It's not like fear is isolation and love is telling the world like who I really am, you know, like there's so much nuance to it and the path of love is a practice 
And you don't have to have these great acts of love that you are shifting into after living this path of fear every single day. Like that's, you know, opposite action is great, but like can be practiced on a small scale because the bigger scale actions are going to be so much harder for us to do and so much more risk and so much more fear of the vulnerability that's required for love. So lots of nuance going on there. For sure. And their, you know, repression leads to more depression. So Mm -hmm. unleashing it in a healthy way is so vital. And the only way out really is through it. So finding a good, safe way to move through your emotions is the only way to heal it. What advice do you have for young people who feel their mental health is being impacted by biphobia, either as part of homophobia or within the LGBTQ plus community? I think the one of the greatest tools that you can have as a young person who is experiencing biphobia or homophobia or feeling the impacts of this shame being thrown at you for who you are is community. I think that that is the greatest tool that anybody struggling with mental health can give themselves is community. Find the like-minded people that are dealing with the same things that you can validate each other and you can lift each other up and you can love each other. And you can be like, the world may see you as wrong, but I see you as right. And I see you as connected with me and I see you as, you know, love. I see you as just the greatest person. So surrounding yourself with other people that are dealing with the same struggles um, is so important in accepting yourself. You're going to see parts of yourself in the people that you surround yourself with. So if you're surrounding yourself with people that you see parts of yourself and you like those parts and you're like, wow, that person reminds me of me and I like that. When I went to college and I was suddenly surrounded by so many more gay people, that was so awesome for me because up until that point, I was the only out woman in my high school, in my grade. And I didn't have a community and then having just simple conversations, we didn't even need to talk about like our trauma, although that was great too, but just to be surrounded by other gay people, other people in the LGBTQ community and see parts of myself that I never saw in anybody else growing up, it made me feel so much less lonely. It made me, it gave me connection and it healed shame in seeing people that I had nothing in common with, which is great to do. Um, but when you're dealing with those, you know, profound amounts of shame, everything that reminds you of what you're not makes you hate yourself more. And when you have a community where you see parts of yourself and you see them as okay, and you're surrounded by people that are giving you permission to be exactly who you are, and then beyond permission, they're like hyping you up to be who you are. I think that's one of the greatest tools that we can give each other is just community and the support that community can provide. Thank you so much, Hannah, for joining us today. I loved our conversation. Everything you said just really like hit me in all the right ways. I'm going to take this knowledge with me and I can't wait to share it with everyone else who needs to hear it. And I hope to see you soon. Yeah. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you so much. One mind. Um, And thank you everyone watching this. I hope um, you, if you get anything out of it, it is just the permission to be exactly who you are and whatever you feel is okay.